Welcome everybody to Southern Maryland's Audubon's presentation, Marshes for Tomorrow, a restoration plan to save Maryland's salt marshes and their birds. We're with David Curson, who's Director of Bird Conservation in Maryland for Audubon Mid-Atlantic. I'm Molly Moore, I'm President of Southern Audubon. Um, Southern Maryland Audubon, for those of you who are not members, works for the protection of birds and their habitat across Southern Maryland and beyond through our educational outreach like this presentation, as well as in our conservation programs, and also in the scholarship programs we have for our teenagers and, and teachers. We record all of our Zoom programs and those archives are on a wide range of bird and wildlife and gardening subjects. They're free for viewing by anyone on our webpage uh, and our YouTube channel. So we more than welcome any of you who aren't members to join our flock. It's easy to sign up on our webpage at southernmarylandaudubon.org. But now I wanna introduce our great speaker tonight, David Curson. He's worked as Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon in Maryland since 2004. Dave leads Audubon's Coastal Resilience Program in Maryland. He partners with a variety of organizations on various projects to prevent the loss of salt marshes and to safeguard endangered beach nesting seabirds. He's led efforts to protect and manage and monitor bird habitats across the Maryland network of important bird areas. And he is one of our main coordinators for grassroots advocacy on issues and legislation affecting birds. Dave did his graduate studies in wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focused on the ecology and behavior of the parasitic brown-headed cowbird. And so Dave, now over to you. Thank you very much, Molly, for that introduction. And um, good evening, everyone. It's a real delight to be back with Southern Maryland Audubon. Um, I've been in this position for 18 years now, nearly 19 years. And uh, over the years, I have periodically come down uh, from Baltimore to, to join uh, Southern Maryland Audubon meetings and to get to know some of you. Um, and uh, it's, it's a shame that you know, we can't do that with pandemic restrictions, but it's really nice to be able to join you on Zoom. And before I get going on the talk, I just wanted to update people a little bit. You may well be aware that in the last uh, year or so, um, the Maryland DC program of Audubon has merged with the Pennsylvania program to create this Mid-Atlantic office. And um, this has been a really fantastic development. Um, it's given us a lot more staff members uh, which means that we now have staff dedicated to functions like uh, communications and policy and um, network engagement, which we didn't have before. So we have a lot more staff capacity. And I really think that this will enhance our ability to um, have positive conservation impact for birds um, across Maryland and the whole Mid-Atlantic. So it's kind of a, a good news and I'm really delighted at this development. But tonight um, I'm gonna to be talking to you about uh, my main focus of my work uh, these days, which is um, conservation of birds and their habitats on our coasts. And I'm particularly focusing on salt marsh tonight. Although at the end of the talk, I've got a little update on our um, a turn nesting island uh, project in the coastal bays. Um, but let's start by talking about uh, salt marshes. And um, let's see, trying to advance the slide here. Here we go. Um, salt marshes are a really unique environment. Um, they occur right on the edge of the, <coughs> of the land, between the land and the sea. And uh, they're dominated by grasses. So essentially, they kind of function as, as almost like a, a tidal prairie. And the bird community kind of reflects that. Some of the birds that we see nesting in our salt marshes around Maryland are quite similar to birds that you might find on the prairies of North Dakota. Uh, this marsh here is actually uh, at the Maryland Ornithological Society's sanctuary in Somerset County, Irish Grove it's called, 
And it's one of the best quality salt marshes in all of Maryland. I really recommend that if you want to see salt marsh birds and you can travel a little way um, to head down there and, um, and, and see uh, the birds. All the birds that I'm talking about do, uh, do breed at Irish Grove. So I thought I'd start off by showing you some of the um, distinctive and specialized birds of the salt marsh. Uh, this is a clapper rail, and uh, clapper rail is a kind of a chicken-sized bird, um, which lives almost exclusively in salt marshes. The east coast populations of clapper rail are confined to this habitat and they'll live in uh, tall vegetation as well as some of the grass vegetation in the higher marsh. And um, you can hear them, they have a very distinctive clattering sound that they do. You more often hear them than you see them. Another very uh, distinctive uh, salt marsh bird that is truly confined to salt marshes is the seaside sparrow. And the seaside sparrow is perhaps one of the more abundant of our salt marsh birds. In all of the large salt marshes over on the eastern shore of Maryland, you can see large numbers of these. They nest uh, throughout the marshes in the high marsh zone, which is only flooded occasionally and tends to be dominated by short grasses, as well as the low marsh zone, which is where much of the taller needle rush and taller grass vegetation is. Another bird, this is perhaps the, the kind of the conservation star of the show when it comes to salt marshes. This is the salt marsh sparrow, and it's very closely related to the seaside sparrow, uh, but it's a little bit more colorful. You can see the kind of uh, orange buff color on the stripes on the head um, and the streaking on the breast. This bird is only found in the high marsh zone of the salt marshes. These are the marshes which are only inundated by tides on spring tides. And they nest in that region of the marsh because they put their nest right down on the ground. If they nested in the lower marshes that are flooded on a daily basis, their nests would get flooded um, every day. But this bird is very much uh, in trouble. It's declining rapidly, about 9% a year across its range. And here in Maryland, we are we kind of have a big responsibility for this species. We actually have about a quarter of the world's population of this species nesting right here in our state. And all of the nesting population of this bird within Maryland is over on the eastern shore where the larger salt marshes are. And I'll be coming back to talk a little bit about salt marsh sparrows later in the talk because of this um, kind of the, the status that they're highly imperiled. And another conservation star of the salt marshes is the black rail. Uh, I'd be amazed if anyone on this call has actually seen one. Um, this is a very secretive bird. It's related to the clapper rail, but it's much smaller. In fact, it's about the same size as the sparrows, the salt marsh sparrow and the seaside sparrow. Uh, black rails used to be um, reasonably common in the marshes of Dorchester County uh, about 30 years ago, but they have declined uh, to the point of almost disappearing in Maryland. There's literally <clears throat> only two or three pairs left in all of Maryland. Um, so they have already been listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And this bird has also um, confined mostly to the higher marshes uh, where it nests to try to avoid uh, the flooding. So let's think about salt marshes. It's not just birds that they are important for. These marshes, we have about 200,000 acres of salt marsh in Maryland, and they provide some really essential ecosystem services um, that other um, environments really don't provide. Um, firstly, many of the commercially important fish in the Chesapeake Bay actually 
um, lay their eggs in the tidal guts of salt marshes and these eggs hatch out and the small fry stage of the fish actually live in tidal creeks within the marshes and the reason for this is that they can find food more easily there without being exposed to, to larger fish predators. Uh, so about two thirds of the commercially important fish uh, have a home in marshes in their very youngest stages. The marshes also provide a physical buffer against storm surge. Uh, we're seeing larger and more violent storms um, these days with climate change and um, the, the grasses, the vegetation of the marsh and the whole um, marsh platform is capable of absorbing a lot of the energy in the storm surge. So that when the storm surge reaches um, houses or um, farmland um, on the landward side, it's lost a lot of its energy and it's much less damaging. Marsh is also really important for our ecotourism industry on the eastern shore, places like Black Border National Wildlife Refuge and Assateague Island have extensive marshes and these are really popular places. They draw visitors from all across the state and beyond and bring in millions of dollars um, to their county's local economies. The marsh is also filter nutrient pollutants. Uh, we have a big problem in the Chesapeake Bay and the, the Maryland coastal bays on the Atlantic shore with uh, nitrates and phosphates uh, polluting the water in agricultural runoff and urban runoff, um, promoting algal blooms within the water. Well, a lot of those nutrients get taken up by the grasses as they grow uh, in, in the marshes. Um, and so the marshes play a really useful role in uh, storing those, those uh, um, nutrient pollutants. Um, another uh, service that the um, marshes provide is really important in the context of climate change. Underneath the grasses that you see growing are uh, sometimes many feet of depth of peat and that peat has accumulated over thousands of years. And it is the semi-decomposed stems and leaf matter of all the grasses that came before the grasses you see living today. And this amounts to a huge store of blue carbon, what we call blue carbon in the sediment. This is a carbon that is kind of locked away under the water. And if it were eroded and released, um, it would decompose rapidly and introduce a lot uh, of carbon dioxide into the, into the atmosphere. And then lastly, um, the biodiversity of marshes is really important. And as, as bird watchers, I'm sure you all uh, are aware of uh, the birds that I just uh, talked about and how unique they are in, in the marshes. Okay, so as you might have gathered from the fact that I've talked about black rail and salt marsh sparrow uh, becoming so imperiled, uh, all is not well in our marshes. And uh, one of the best places to illustrate this is out there in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. This, this photo shows the last house on Holland Island. And Holland Island used to be quite a large island, about 300 acres, um, about 160 people lived there in the late 19th century. It had school, post office, all the functions of a coastal community. And by 2010, there was only one house left. The island had eroded down to just a couple of acres and uh, supported a large colony of brown pelicans as it still does, but no people. And the owner of this house would regularly go out to the house to try to shore up the edges and save this, save the structure but sadly, just a few months after I took this photo in the autumn of 2010, the, this house collapsed into the sea. And um, this illustrates um, basically the erosion that we're seeing all around the Chesapeake Bay on not just the islands, but also on the, <clears throat> the shoreline around the bay. And uh, thousands of acres of marsh have already been lost to erosion that is induced by um, largely by sea level rise. So let's take a look at the particular 
um, vulnerability of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Chesapeake Bay is, is kind of doubly vulnerable to sea level rise. There are two reasons for that sea level rise. Firstly, um, the mid-Atlantic region is subsiding and it has been doing so for thousands of years, about one and a half um, millimeters a year, the land actually is sinking. And this is due to a long-term um, geological process. In the Ice Age, the weight of ice on Canada pushed the, um, they kind of pushed the other end of the plate in the mid-Atlantic region up. And then as the ice melted at the end of the Ice Age, Canada rose and the mid-Atlantic area sank again. And that process is still going on, even though um, the Ice Age finished thousands of years ago. Uh, it's called isostatic rebound. The same thing is happening in the, uh, the Gulf states down in Louisiana. So this um, geological process compounds the, the new recent process of sea level rise due to the thermal expansion of the oceans. So with global warming and climate change, as the seas, the oceans of the world warm, they expand. And the only way that they, uh, when water ex it, uh, warms, it expands, and the only way it can move is up. It can't expand downwards. And so this is what causes sea level rise across the globe. Well, with the combination of the geological subsidence and the global um, climate-induced sea level rise, uh, it's predicted that sea levels in Maryland will rise by about a meter. It's about three feet this century, which is a phenomenal amount. And this uh, sea level rise is already having a huge impact on our marshes. Now, this series of maps illustrates the um, the extent of the problem. This is Dorchester County. Some of you may be familiar uh, with it. I'll show you here with my cursor. This is Cambridge. And then this is Blackwater Refuge down here. Um, so this series of maps shows a computer prediction by the uh, sea levels affecting marsh migration model. That's called SLAM. And um, the, the colors show uh, a worrying trend. The red and the pink are areas of high tidal marsh, which are only, um, only inundated on spring tides and are, are basically good breeding habitat for our salt marsh birds. Now, this first map shows the condition in 2010. Now, under 42 centimeters of sea level rise, which is predicted to happen by 2050, most of that marsh will have converted to low marsh, which is the pale blue, which is marsh that's still vegetated, but it floods on the daily tidal cycle. And also you can see these areas of darker blue, which are um, open water. And then by 2100, under the predicted meter of sea level rise, you have the entire southern area of Dorchester County converting to open water. And that includes the loss of nearly all of Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, this the hatched area here, but also little villages that are down here, Wingut, Crapo, Golden Hill, uh, probably about a thousand people live in those villages. So those are, um, already feeling the effects of, of uh, sea level rise, but they um, have a very uncertain future indeed. So this is a huge problem. And what, what can we do about it? Well, over the last 10 years, uh, bird conservationists have really woken up to this threat to, um, to these uh, specialized birds in uh, the salt marshes. And there's one <coughs> coalition uh, called the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture. It's uh, a coalition of Fish and Wildlife Service and then the state um, wildlife agencies up and down the East Coast. And they uh, are focused on this particular problem of marsh loss. Uh, I sit on the, I represent Audubon on the management board of the ACJV. 
And over the last five years, we've been working on a salt marsh bird conservation plan. And among the many strategies in there are some habitat restoration strategies. And uh, these fall into two categories, really. What can we do to save these marshes in terms of managing the habitat? Well, firstly, we can try to raise up the surface of the marshes by putting dredge sediments on the surface and lifting them up around four to six inches at a time uh, to keep them ahead of sea level rise. Another thing we can do is to actually improve the drainage on the surface with very small channels that are just designed to kind of allow floodwaters to run off uh, as the tides go down so that um, surface water doesn't remain on the, on the surface and actually lead to water logging, which can kill the marsh plants. And then another thing that we can do is we can actually help the process of the, these marshes slowly migrating inland as tides reach further up slope. And this is happening in a lot of places, uh, particularly if you go down to Blackwater, you'll see huge areas of dead forest. And those areas of dead forest are actually where it used to be land, and now the salt water has claimed it, and it's become marsh or even open water. And so one thing we, we need to try to kind of help um, the process of marshes migrating uh, into these areas. Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of Audubon projects that have tried to implement or are trying to implement some of these strategies. We've actually done about four or five different projects. I'm going to talk about just two um, in this talk. And the first one I'd like to mention is uh, a project at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. We did it in 2016. And the the method is called thin layer placement. Basically, this is taking sediments uh, that have been dredged from open water and spraying them onto the surface of the marsh to lift the surface of the marsh up. Um, so the, as you can see, uh, this, this road here is Maple Dam Road. For those of you that know Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, it, it goes down to cross the Blackwater River here and it now floods on every high tide of, of the year. You'll see water on the road every day. And 10 years ago, that was not the case. So this whole area is sinking fast and the marshes around it are literally opening up um, as the waters rise. You can see this lower photo here. This is a, a kind of an early stage of decay of the marshes. The waters have risen enough in this photo to basically drown and destroy the root mat of these plants. This is uh, only three square uh, uh, chairmaker's bulrush, it's sometimes called. And a lot of the marshes have this vegetation on down there. And you can see this process of interior erosion beginning where this pool is opening up. And as these plants die, this pool will get bigger and bigger until it becomes a large open pool. And then it will start to get wave action on it. And, and that will accelerate the expansion of these pools. So the way these marshes erode isn't so much shoreline erosion from the edge. It's kind of a, almost like a Swiss cheese opening up holes in the middle of the marsh. It's interior erosion. <clears throat> so, we uh, wanted to do a, a kind of a pilot project where we would take uh, sediment from the river, River Blackwater, and spray it onto the marsh, we, uh, about 30 acres of the marsh, to see if we could restore a higher marsh condition. And we wanted to do that just to prolong the life of the marsh uh, and maintain its integrity, but also to see if we could actually return this rather fragmented marsh to a nice meadow of high marsh grasses that are suitable for salt marsh sparrow. 
Their partners on this project were the Fish and Wildlife Service at Blackwater Refuge and the Conservation Fund, who got a large grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And this part of the project cost $1.1 million to dredge and treat um, these 30 acres. So it's a very expensive undertaking. And this is just to illustrate what it's like to walk on this decaying marsh. I was monitoring the birds on this project and um, a couple of times I, I took someone with me and I'm glad I did because uh, every uh, after a, a while, um, year by year, it just got worse and worse. And so in the end, this would happen about 20 times in a morning. I would just fall through the surface of the marsh and need someone to pull me out. So the results of this project, well, I guess not the results, but here's some photos of the work in action. You can see here uh, the slurry of sediment that's being taken by dredge from Blackwater River being sprayed onto the marsh. And then this large machine here, which they call a marsh buggy, moves the pipe around to make sure that all of the um, project sites gets treated with the sediment. And then there's wooden boards are uh, uh, witness boards um, to guide the machine operators as to how much sediment needs to be added to the marsh. Um, so we took 26,000 cubic yards of material and spread it across 30 acres. And the results were, I would say, pretty encouraging. Um, it was a what I would call a partial success. We achieved the target elevation, and you can see these before and after photos. The pools all got filled in and vegetated, which was great. We got a really good natural regrowth of some of the natural marsh grasses there. Um, but the um, we did not manage to get it high enough to actually uh, create high marsh meadow, uh, which is the Spartina patens. You see this S patens. The Spartina patens is the dominant grass on the high marsh where the salt marsh sparrows live. So we managed to stabilize the marsh, but not to take it high enough to return it to the high marsh conditions. Now, we're currently working on another thin layer placement project, and this is a bigger, more ambitious project uh, down in Somerset County at Deal Island uh, Wildlife Management Area. Here you can see the habitat photo here. It's a mixture of this needle rush. It's very sharp needle rush uh, vegetation and tall Spartina grasses. Uh, we want to try to return this to more of the high marsh uh, Spartina patens habitat as well for salt marsh sparrow. Now this project has a lot more partners in it. It's part of the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, navigation dredging. Every four years, they have to dredge the lower Wicomico River uh, to keep the port of Salisbury open for shipping traffic. And they've been looking for new places to put their um, sediment. And Audubon teamed up with the DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service, and we found this site, which was in need of topping up the sediment um, to restore it. <clears throat> the uh, Deal Island. WMA is owned and managed by uh, Maryland DNR, Department of Natural Resources. So the goals of the project are basically to restore 75 acres of marsh and try to return it to a habitat which is suitable for salt marsh sparrow, and also to protect um, the, uh, the berm around a large freshwater impoundment uh, from erosion. The impoundment's really important for duck hunting and is uh, the largest impoundment in Maryland. It's about two and a half thousand acres. And you can see this long list of partners uh, who are all working together to try to make this project a success. Uh, the Army Corps has a lot of experience with dredging and with uh, filling in areas with sediment, but they don't have a lot of experience with actually trying to achieve a very particular um, height of the marsh to get um, a particular habitat as we are doing. So we've been uh, working together on the design of this. And one challenging aspect has been 
figuring out how high the sediments need to be to get just the right height for supporting the Spartina patens grass that the salt marsh sparrow needs. And um, this rather complicated graph shows how uh, we uh, came up with a target uh, height. These uh, green and blue um, curves are the recorded um, tidal heights nearby at Bishop's Head, um, which is near Deal Island. And so what we did was we wanted to know how high would the ground need to be to provide a marsh surface that was free of flooding for a whole nest cycle of a salt marsh sparrow. That's 25 days. So this black horizontal bar right here is a 25 day bar. And we literally just kind of placed it on top of the green peaks to see where, at what height it would have to sit uh, to keep a salt marsh sparrow nest flood free. The, the salt marsh sparrow nest is here, just 10 centimeters above the ground level. And we did this over 10 different years of, of data over the last 10 years. And uh, that's how we have set our target elevation uh, for the, the new marsh surface at Deal Island. Now this, uh, let me just hop back here quickly because uh, this project has got delayed a couple of times, but this coming year, 2023, uh, is when dredging will start. And so in October through to January, um, the Army Corps will be dredging the Wacomico River and will be trying to achieve this height. After that, we're going to replant the, um, the whole area with grasses and, um, and then monitor. We have a big, uh, a large team of, of people who are monitoring birds, vegetation, and many other aspects of the marsh. And we're going to continue monitoring it for a few years and see if we can actually create uh, the habitat that we need for the birds. Now, these projects are great, um, but each of them actually restores less than 100 acres of marsh. And I was saying earlier, we have 200,000 acres of marsh in the Chesapeake Bay. And this is all threatened by sea level rise. We need to try to accelerate and rapidly scale up um, this marsh restoration process. Um, and so Audubon is uh, working on a plan with many partners to try and do just this. And here's another illustration of just how dire the situation is. If you look at the, um, oops, sorry. If you look at the photo on the right, uh, this shows a small section of the Maryland Coastal Bays marshes near Ocean City in 2005. Um, and you can see that there are still large areas in this photo of fairly intact marsh around here. Here's a pond, but here's an area of intact marsh. And these marshes were really um, good for salt marsh sparrows about 10 years ago. Well, if we look at the more recent air photo, from 2018, you can see that all of these areas have these linear ponds in now. And these are depressions between uh, grid ditches. The whole area was grid ditched um, about 100 years ago. And so with sea level rise, you're seeing water retained on the surface. And it's basically eroding out this whole area from the inside out. So in the space of just 10, 13 years, uh, this really good habitat for what is essentially an imperiled bird has become almost non-viable. So this just shows how quickly uh, these marshes are decaying. So um, the plan that we'd like to implement is actually a companion plan to that Atlantic Coast Joint Venture salt marsh plan because the ACJV produced a plan specifically for the salt marsh sparrow. Um, it's, it is actually a candidate species for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And uh, the entire global population of salt marsh sparrow 
about 10 years ago was around 60,000 birds. Well, it's thought that this is um, gone down by almost half now. So only around 30,000 birds are left. And this uh, saltmarsh sparrow conservation plan has um, targets for population of this species and um, how much habitat they need for each state in the Atlantic Flyway. And you can see here, Maryland uh, has a target population goal, Zort Marsh Sparrow, 6,302. I guess the computer model can spat that number out. And then in order to support that population of Zort Marsh Sparrows, we need nearly 25,000 acres of um, high marsh habitat. And so we have Audubon and our partners, we've set that as our goal uh, for what we would like to achieve. And we have raised some money to create this restoration plan for Maryland salt marshes. Here's a little bit of detail. We got $620,000 from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This is from their Nutria Eradication Program, which has been very successful. Um, and is actually meant to pay not just for the eradication of the nutria, but also for repairing the marshes that were damaged by nutria. And I guess I should explain what nutria are. This is an invasive rodent from South America, which escaped from fur farms in Dorchester County 100 years ago and spent many decades chomping their way through the marshes and really uh, causing a lot of marsh erosion. So this eradication program has, has, has been really successful in removing nutria from the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and Audubon, we fundraised for more money from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And we heard just last month, December, that we got $416,000. And with this money, uh, we can expand the scope of our plan to include all of the um, marshes, all of the large uh, salt marshes in Maryland, and also to have a, a much larger community engagement uh, piece of this, and to begin actually implementing some uh, some restoration work as well. So the details of this plan are over the next two years, we want to create a plan that identifies the most suitable 25,000 acres of high marsh uh, that we need for supporting salt marsh sparrow and other salt marsh birds over the long term in Maryland. And when we've identified and mapped these marshes, picked out the best of the best, we want to figure out what restoration strategies we need for that long term conservation. And we actually plan to create a kind of a sequence pipeline of projects to, um, to implement these strategies, whether it's putting sediments on the marsh or um, improving the hydrology to drain off floodwaters. And we also want to engage with local communities to um, you know, find out what people think about their marshes, but also to identify private landowners who want to participate in these restoration projects. Um, early indications are that I think private landowners are more than willing uh, to have someone come along and try to save their marsh for them. So the way that we're going to do implement this um, restoration plan is through a, a conservation network of many uh, partnership groups. So the Delmarva Restoration and Conservation Network uh, was convened by the Fish and Wildlife Service about six or seven years ago. And there's about 40 groups, uh, nonprofit organizations, as well as counties and um, government agencies at the state level. As, and the federal level. Um, and we're all working together um, towards trying to produce an integrated strategy uh, to implement uh, and fund um, marsh restoration, but also uh, restoration in other habitats around um, the Delmarva Peninsula. So we'll be implementing our salt marsh plan through this network of partners. And this map shows that we've already done some prioritization work. And these orange areas on this map, um, I'll, I'll orient you here a little bit. This is 
Cambridge here. And then Route 50 goes across Delmarva to Ocean City here. So we've got the coastal bays, marshes, and also Blackwater, Deal Island, and the Pocomoke Sound. We've already picked out 80,000 acres of the best marshes where salt marsh sparrows can live. And we're going to narrow that down further to 25,000 acres uh, to actually do restoration projects on. Because there's no way that we can save all of these marshes um, in Maryland. It's uh, too expensive and uh, it's, a, it's a race against the clock too. So we're trying to pick out the best marshes to work on and focus on. Now, that is the end of the salt marsh part. I can go straight on and do um, a summary of the turn nesting, or we could stop and have questions and I could um, and then show a few slides about this year's results for the turn nesting project. Molly, what do you think? Why don't you uh, go ahead right? and do the turns and then we'll open up to questions on both if that works for you. Oh yeah, that works just fine. Yeah, okay. So um, you may well be aware that we have, Audubon has a project in the coastal bays uh, in which we have uh, created a floating wooden raft as nesting habitat for common terns. And uh, each year we assemble this raft from individual raft units and tow it out into the coastal bays and anchor it down and assemble it together into a large island. And we do this in partnership with the uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the Maryland Coastal Bays Program. And so uh, this year, or 2022 was the second year of the project. So uh, what I'm showing here is the day on which we launched the rafts last year, uh, 11, well, it's two days, 11th and 12th of April. And you can see the raft units lined up along the boat ramp here um, at South Point. And um, we have a uh, clamshell raked out on the surface of these as nesting substrate for the birds. And uh, we had three boats, there's just one of them shown there. Uh, and then we have a large team of people uh, eagerly waiting to uh, uh, prepare these rafts, tow them out and, and tie, uh, join them together. So this is what it looks like to take two of those raft units and, and join them together with the steel plates, create, this is two units that are each eight foot by 16 foot. So you put those together, you get a 16 foot by 16 foot section. And this year, we um, joined nine of those sections together to create a large island, 48 feet by 48 feet. And what these volunteers are doing is they're standing uh, on a designated place to try to level up these two raft units so that the carpenter can uh, tighten up the bolts. Uh, so he kind of says to you, oh, move this way a bit, that way a bit, until we get this, uh, the whole raft level. Now then these are towed out and assembled, and this is the fully assembled island, nine of those square units. So this is 48 feet by 48 feet. And you can see we've got some tufts of plastic grass out there uh, to act as a, a bit of a shelter for some of the birds. We have little chick shelters made of wood. Um, you can see um, these uh, uh, solar panels, which provide energy for a sound system that plays the calls of common terms to try to attract the terms to the island uh, to make it sound like, seem like there's an active colony there already. And we have turn uh, decoys out there. You can't see those in that, this photo, but the turn decoys serve the same function to attract common terms to the island. Um, this year we, uh, took Larry Hogan out to see the project. Uh, this was in June, I guess he was coming to the end of his term and he did a bit of a victory lap around the Eastern shore. Uh, and we took him out to show him the project. He was very, um, very interested in it and very supportive. It was really good to have his uh, to interest in the project. And um, here is a photo of a common turn feeding its uh, chick with a, a 
fish, which I don't know, maybe is a bit large for the chick to swallow. I'm not sure about that one. It looks a bit big. But this year, we had fantastic results on this project. We had 155 common turn nests and uh, over 180 chicks um, from those nests. And this actually represented the second largest common turn colony in Maryland. And that not only illustrates how successful the raft uh, project is, but it also illustrates how desperate these birds are for nest sites. Because just like the islands in the Chesapeake Bay have been eroding, the same thing's been happening in the Maryland coastal bays. And there's almost no um, suitable natural nest sites left for them. So, which is why they desperately need uh, these artificial sites. <clears throat> now, when it comes to this year, um, we actually would like to try to um, implement a related strategy <clears throat> in the coastal bays. You know, just providing these artificial platforms is really not enough to save uh, common terns or black skimmers and royal terns, which are also in. Uh, peril in uh, in our region. What we really need is a, a system for rebuilding the natural islands, and um, that's going to take dredge material. <coughs> it's going to take a lot of partners, and uh, basically uh, competition for sand, because the Army Corps does mine a lot of sand in the Ocean City area, but they use it to rebuild the beaches at Ocean City. We would like to try to set up an agreement with the Army Corps and the town of Ocean City and other stakeholders in the area, which can use some of the sand to make sure that four or five natural islands in the area are rebuilt uh, so that we can, and, and then maintained as nesting islands for these birds so that we can make sure that black skimmers, royal terns and common terns have nesting habitat. Uh, going long into the future. And uh, I'll end by saying that, uh, that this project was actually featured on Outdoors Maryland on television, Maryland Public Television in November. And if you go to, if you just Google Outdoors Maryland, it will take you straight to um, the MPT site. And uh, the November 15th uh, program uh, featured the project. So it's well worth a look. There's a nice 12 minute section on that program. So I think that is the end. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll take us back to this slide here. And I'd love to you know, um, answer any questions that people might have. David, thank you so much. I mean, this is just really, really fascinating work. But uh, I'm going to hit you with the first question here. Um, sure. It seems like a Herculean task. I mean, and you identified on the grass that there's a very specific level that the salt water um, uh, salt marsh sparrow needs. And mm -hmm. then you talked about how the um, waters are rising three feet in this century. So once y'all do bring the silt in and build it up, how long do you think it'll last? That's a really good, uh, a good question. Um, it may well be that uh, marshes that we restore will need to be treated again after maybe 30 or 40 years. Um, we don't actually know how long they'll last, but my guess is that it will be something like 30 or 40 years um, because we're, we're, we're new to this. And so we have to kind of feel our way. Um, one thing I'm pretty certain of is that we probably cannot achieve this 25,000 acre target, which sounds like a, a negative thing. And it is in a way, but I guess I say that to illustrate the fact that we just need to get going and do our best. We need to try to restore as much as we can and to, um, to try to increase funding um, and to, to save this, this ecosystem. Every bit we can save and maintain is something won. Um, so it's, I think it's a, it's a challenge not to become disheartened by the scale of the challenge. <laughs> Um, well, if folks have questions, you can um, uh, either put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. I'm going to uh, uh, read one question here we have from Amy Henderson. 
I live on the waterfront in Southern Maryland along the shore of Breton Bay off the Lower Potomac. Are there things that I can do to help preserve marshes in my area? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, if you do own marshes, you know, there are, are some things you can do. One of them is to consider a living shoreline. Um, if you are trying to protect um, your shoreline around your house or your land, I know some people are tempted to try hardened shorelines with riprap or, or kind of bulkhead. Um, and this works for a little while, but the mother nature is so persistent that if you do that, you can end up with a riprap wall out in the water as the erosion marches in uh, towards land. Um, and it's probably worth trying installing a living shoreline and making sure that you have a kind of a natural edge around your land. Uh, so if you if you have marsh, you may already have this. Um, but uh, uh, you know, living shorelines can help in general. And I guess if you if you already have marsh, sometimes there are restoration actions you can take by um, putting structures a little bit out into the water to try to cut down on the erosion uh, of the waves. Um, sometimes the uh, oyster reefs and other structures. Now, Audubon's not really, um, we're not doing those kind of projects because we're focused on um, the larger marshes for the birds, but the Department of Natural Resources has a lot of information on their website. And so I would consult the DNR website for information if you are a marsh landowner. Yeah, and that may answer the next, a little bit, the next question. Um, of Anne asking, where can I go to learn more about techniques to stop erosion on my property? It does not appear that I am in the target zone for saving, and I'd still like to save my little corner of the world. Yes, I think the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources website, is a great place to go. There's quite a lot of resources on coastal resilience uh, there. And I'd like to ask you, David, if I could, a question on the black rail. With so few of, of them here, what can you do to, to save them? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, <clears throat> that's a really good question. One, I, we're hoping that by providing more high marsh, that there'll be habitat where they can nest successfully. But we're also considering alternatives, uh, which is to try to provide uh, suitable habitat away from the marshes. Uh, there are certain wastewater treatment plants that have um, some old style filtration beds that actually pipe the wastewater through very gradual sloping grassy banks. And the fact that you have this very shallow layer of water continually and this wet uh, kind of grassland, um, black rails will actually nest in these places sometimes. Uh, the, there's a, a, the Eastern Wastewater Treatment Plant in Talbot County um, has one of these systems. And so there's a project, uh, it was, it was um, they stopped using it about, I think about seven or eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And there's a project to try to get them to reinstate them to see if we can create habitat that's suitable for black rail. Great. So last call here, any other questions? Uh, anyone wanna throw out to David? David, thank you so much. This is amazing. And clearly you have a job for life here um, because yeah. the work's not going away anytime soon, but thanks so much for sharing uh, what y'all are doing with us. It was really, really fascinating. Great, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's, I'm really glad that people found it interesting. So, uh, and my email is right here on the slide. So if people have follow-up questions or want to contact me about this work, uh, please feel free to do so. Great, and you're getting a lot of kudos in the chat, thanking for, your, for the presentation. And we look forward uh, to having you back again with more updates. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, David. And thanks everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we hope you come back. Uh, continually and also check our website for recordings of all of our past uh, presentations and this one will be up in the next few days as well. So thanks everyone. Thanks.